Good morning and welcome to the Digital Construction Summit 2020, the key virtual event for digital decision makers in the built environment. I'd like to thank our partners for this three-day event, the Chartered Institute of Building, Construction Manager, BIM Plus, Atvero, the Centre for Digital Built Britain, I3PT, Ignite, Plan Radar, Build Dots, 3D Repo, and Oculo. And we're about to start the first webinar of seven in this Digital Construction Summit, putting digital at the heart of the built environment's recovery in association with Build Dots. I'm your chair for today's webinar, Will Mann, editor of Construction Manager, and I'm very pleased to introduce our four speakers for this first session. David Philp, Impact Director at the Construction Innovation Hub. Fiona Moore, Information Management Consultant with the Centre for Digital Built Britain. Mark Enzer, Digital Director, also with the Centre for Digital Built Britain and joining us from Tel Aviv in Israel, Aviv Libovici, Chief Product Officer and co-founder of Build Dots. So the theme of today's programme is to look at the key strategies that will accelerate digital adoption in the wake of COVID-19. And that includes modernising the sector through digital and manufacturing technologies, promoting better information management and secure, resilient data sharing, interoperability between proprietary technologies across the whole asset life cycle, the role of the National Digital Twin Program and the Gem Gemini Principles, and how artificial, artificial intelligence technology can transform process management. Plus there'll be a Q&A at the end of today's session. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, please use the Q&A function to ask questions during presentations. Panelists will try to answer questions using the Q&A function once they have finished presenting, but any unanswered questions will be addressed in the Q&A session after the presentations have concluded. And you can use the hashtag DCS2020 to share on social media. Okay, so I'm now about to introduce our first speaker. That is David Philp, who um, is from the Construction Innovation Hub. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and invite David to start his presentation. Over to you, David. Thank you, Will, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Will, you've not stopped sharing your screen yet? Good morning, everyone. I'm just waiting on Will and sharing his screen. Sorry, Dave, I think I have unshared. No, I'm, I'm getting an error message. You cannot start screen share while other participant is sharing. So, Okay, bear with me. So, Will, Will, Will is getting us ready. I say good morning, everyone. As you heard from Will, I'm David Phil. I think that's me now, hopefully. No, sorry, Will, still not, still not happening. Sorry about this, Dave. That's okay. Uh, hopefully that says no. Yeah, that says no. Thanks, Will. Yep. Great. There we go. So good morning, everyone. And as you have from Will, I'm David Philp, and I'm Impact Director for Digital at the Construction Innovation Hub. And I'm really delighted, I'm sure, of my fellow panelists to join today's inaugural session, which is focused on how we put digital at the heart of the built environment's recovery. So who am I? Well, I'm David Phil, and sorry, I'm just jumping about a bit. I'm David Phil. I've been with Anissi for some 25 years, and I think probably for the past decade, I've been working in a sector, I think probably for about the last decade, that's increasingly digitized, working with themes from building information model, digital asset management, and I think even increasingly digital twinning as well. So what we're seeing is a real maturity within the marketplace. And, you know, really delighted to join today's events. And I think, 
like most events, this one has now become digital enabled. And I'm really looking forward to letting you know how at Hub we're putting digital at the heart of the built environment's recovery. And I think it's quite amazing when you consider the major impact that COVID has had in our sector. It's clear that construction, along with many other sectors or economy, I think it's fair to say will be irreversibly changed. The new normal will be anything but normal. And I think also, you know, reflection, you know, the aftershocks of COVID may well not be with us for probably years to come. So for us, digital enabled ways of working will become the norman. And that's with working practice, which we used to take for granted, probably becoming redundant. So it's really important we take time out at conferences today and explore the opportunity that digital can afford us as we go forward within there. So as Will mentioned, I work for the Construction Innovation Hub or Hub within there. So actually, who are we and what's our mission? So Hub brings together expertise from three centres. So you hear from Mark and Fiona in terms of the Centre for Digital Build Britain, but we also work alongside the Manufacturing Technology Centre and the Building Research Establishment to transform UK construction. Many of you may know that Hub was launched back in 2018 and it's funded through UK Research and Innovations Transforming Construction Industrial Challenge Fund. And Sorry about that, everyone. Dave has just been bounced out. Um, Dave, are you back with us now? I will, yes. OK, if you want to carry on. I think you were bounced out for some reason there, but please carry uh, on. Yeah, OK, I hope we'll come back within there as well. So, so the, the big part, as we're saying, within the Hub's mission is very much to be a catalyst for transforming our sector through manufacturing technologies, digital ways of working. And, you know, what we're trying to do, again, key to today's theme as well, is boost productivity, exports and asset performance. It's really at the heart of it is going to benefit society within there as well. So we provide a complementary skills across our three centres. Again, big themes for us are manufacturing, digital, but also measurement and assessment of asset performance as well, which ties in very much into government soft landings. And as you hear from Mark, in terms of digital twinning as well. So how do we start to adapt to this new normal that I've talked about within there? Well, I think if anything, recent events have only reinforced that need for transformation. And the past few months have brought really unprecedented challenges for industry. And I think, as we mentioned, impact probably not yet realized. Yet at the same time, construction, we've had the opportunity to demonstrate the crucial outcomes that we can deliver for society. I think it's fair to say we've witnessed passion, determination, and agility, especially in terms of response around about COVID and how we can create vital infrastructure. We're probably seeing you know, life-saving facilities at both Nightingale and up in Scotland, NHS Louisiana Jordan being constructed in record times. I think it's given us a glimpse of what the future could look like if we renew our focus on positive outcomes that we can deliver. I think it's fair to say also during this time, we've seen a seismic shift towards digital, how we collaborate, how we share information. And I think it's fair to say how we also think the construction sector is using this thing called the common data environment that's been really key within there as well. So the use of transformative digital technologies, I think it's fair to say if these were fully embraced, again, it's going to help us be more sustainable, more productive, and actually come more effective in terms of operating right across the whole life cycle. And I was lucky enough to see firsthand up at Louisiana Jordan, you know, how we're starting to take steps within there as well, do better ways of doing things. I love this quote from Stuart Brown from National Health Service in Scotland. You know, there's 700 people on that project. And the big thing was there, you know, the success of the people was down to the hard work, but also it was unquestionable that digital and innovative use of data helped reduce program, but to do it more safely and actually digital and data helping us solve complex projects. And you can see from this slide, you know, some of the key things in terms of how technology was used across all the different supply chain partners within there. Again, making you notes know, more innovative ways of working and delivering this healthcare facility smarter, faster, better within there. Again, we've been lucky at National Health Service Scotland has been a key collaborator on some of the hub's key themes in terms of how we converge BIM and government soft landings and indeed digital state within there as well. But again, helping us start to think about how we can better collaborate and make better, smarter use of data within there as well. So whilst the long-term vision remains, at Hub we are reprioritizing our program to ensure we play a role in sector recovery. We must continue to accelerate the journey towards transformation. 
At the same time, we're determined to play our part in post-COVID sector recovery and can you continue your role as that catalyst for transformation. At Hub, we really support the CLC's roadmap for sector, uh, sector plan recovery launched back in June. And we think it will not only help us recover, but emerge from the current crisis stronger and better. And we've really began to adapt our programme to ensure that we can support it. In particular, driving adoption of digital and manufacturing. And also making sure it's underpinned by a truly value-based approach to decision making as well within there. So we really focused on actually how can we actually do things better in the future and digital playing a key theme within there as well. One of our key themes that ties into the whole digital agenda as well though is our platform design solution. So manufacturing a key theme and we've organised ourselves within Hub in a way that will allow us to focus on our full technical strands of work that are closely related to each other. So four key themes, value, manufacturing, assurance, and our whole digital strand. So if we join up our programme, it's going to allow us to deploy new approaches in a phased way while it's continuously measuring, learning, and adapting. As we mentioned, as you can see by a slide within there, you know, our technical solution is a platform approach. What we've witnessed is currently, the majority of buildings in the UK are procured individually designed conventionally and constructed on site using traditional skills and material, which is a big issue in terms of COVID recovery. However, we are seeing examples of modern methods of construction increasingly being used, it might be modular or volumetric within there. But despite this progress, these solutions are not yet deployed at scale. Again, not all clients are aware of the use of them. So a big part we're trying to promote, if you like, the whole world of MMC and how it can be deployed across multiple building types within there. And you can see from this next slide, our platform construction system program. So we're working with industry to identify and co-develop a digitally enabled platform solution, one that can be designed, manufactured, and sold in a structural carrier frame that can be used across multiple building types. And our platform design program, it builds upon the government's ambitions and the IPA's call for evidence for platform-based design and manufacturing assembly. Big part of those are digital solutions and they will provide, if you like, they'll support you know, this route to recovery and underpin the future of not just the platform, but resilience of our sector. And what we're seeing with compared with traditional construction, the data requirements for the platform you're seeing are going to be front loaded and fixed. Well, that will help us improve process and efficiencies and indeed quality of information exchanges throughout the concept design and construction of our operation. Well, this is also made possible with our suite of tools we call it our platform construction digital wrapper, which include tools such as digital route to assurance. So we believe that actually can, if we embed digital and manufacturing technologies and processes, we start to lay the foundation for a sector that's really much more resilient within there. And the big part adds value across the whole life. So if you look at our platform construction system, the first thing we're trying to do just now is create a virtual prototype all within the context of a common data environment. So we can see at the first off, digital prototyping, the use of BIM, is helping us build a virtual parametric assemblies and component parts. So we're using BIM, BIM offering tools to create a kit of parts, but we test it. So increasingly we're using it to test constructability and from a soft landings maintainability, look in terms of failure mode analysis, structure analysis, increasingly testing analysis and simulation tools. And what this does, it will help us seed the component library and create a virtual prototype and start to be able to think more and more about creating an object library for the future of the platform as well. We think it's quite unique as well because the prototype in terms of this virtual environment as a demonstrator will help us test in terms of how digital tools will help us shift, not just in terms of BIM, but product lifecycle manufacture. So bringing together design and manufacture, advanced manufacture, and testing the flow of data between stages and process. And obviously interoperability is a big issue, which Fiona will touch upon as well there. So we can start to use it to optimize the whole manufacturing line and create a tested set of manufacturing rules, which are key to the platform construction system. Our enabling framework as well, it also looks in terms of themes for value, assurance and digital. And again, you can see there, we've got to recognize that having a tech solution for the platform in itself is not alone for transformation. So again, we're working again in terms of it's informed by our value assurance and digital themes 
within there as well. But one of the things as well, again, always like to stress it is trying to do this, making sure we embed security and security mindedness in terms of all we do. One of the key things we are doing again is working alongside some of the leading minds in the industry to develop a new value framework that sets out to tackle the key challenges in terms of what we should be valuing and what should be measuring and how we should be using that to make decisions. So looking at the data that's needed for key decisions there, but value measured by border and longer term set of measures. And you can see within there starting to build, if you like, working with the, the Construction Leadership Council in terms of a wide definition of value. And to this end, we've actually already started to work on a new web-based tool, which will help clients to articulate their value expectations. Again, tying into soft landings, set performance criteria, and compare schemes, compare different options, like again, using BIM and their digital tools, and the way that can be designed, procured, and measured right through that whole life cycle as well. One of the keys to our programme as well is our assurance framework. And again, it's ensuring that our new platform solutions, assemblies and systems can be demonstrated to comply with regulations and standard. And one of the key things we're trying to do is to make sure that we're developing a framework that includes both physical and digital testing. So starting to think about a multi-component and parametric 3D testing within there. So our assurance framework includes testing and certification of components and system and demonstration of performance data and approvals of suppliers all within a digital system. So we need to test the opportunity in 3D parametric, both physically and digital within there. So we're developing a series of new tools that's going to help us do this as well. Also today though, we are key is talking about our digital theme. So digital for us is a thread that runs right through the entire hub program. And our digital tools and concepts will help inform value-led decisions, will support digital compliance, and key to it is improving information management. The framework we're developing informs data required for measuring against our value framework, demonstrating compliance with assurance, but one of the big parts is looking in terms of information management and information requirements. And one of the key things, especially if Fiona has been working on, is a wiki that's currently out for tender that starts to build an information requirements framework within there as well. One of the big things, though, is looking in terms of how data is going to support decision making. And I'm sure, as Marco mentioned as well, how it's consistent with the Gemini principles. And one of the things we are doing is working along our British Standards Institute and the UK BIM Alliance, helping shift towards the UK BIM framework, which replaces uh, BIM Level 2 and including the ISO 19650 and soft landings. Please, if you haven't, please go into the UK BIM framework. There's some great guidance out there that will really help you within that journey as well. We're also building and driving an international programme to ensure the UK cements its world leading position. And one of the big challenges that Fiona, I'm sure, will mention in her one uh, session is the, you know, the wicked problem of interoperability, which is key within there as well. And we're working with government in terms of the National Infrastructure Commission to drive adoption of the National Digital Twin and its principles, which Mark will mention as well within there. So really, digital and applied technologies, we believe, will help us model and understand the parameters of sustainable operations. We believe in terms of recovery, it's going to optimize our whole life outcomes, transform how and what we build, but also it's going to help us, we believe, drive towards high performing assets and that encouragement to use high performance computing, energy analysis, and increasingly internet of things. We think it will help us to automate processes and we think it will really help us achieve that fundamental goal of net zero. So I think in addition to accelerating the pace of sector transformation, we can also help to maintain the UK's reputation as that world leader in that digital built environment. And for me, that's going to benefit the economy as a whole. But again, we've got to get back to basics. And we think the first step is actually trying to embed the digital tools, the processes, as I mentioned, especially the UK BIM framework. But we also need to make sure that we converge with other related themes, especially manufacturing, digital twinning, and how it can help us support ever complex infrastructure challenges, especially those about productivity and quality. And again, thinking about the new norm as we started, I think as many organisations, this is going to become permanent. And we need to think about our existing infrastructure as well, looking at things like occupancies and how our assets will change dramatically there. So one of the things we are doing is creating guidance around about digital estate and how digital can help us do more with the assets we already have. So to summarize, we think digital process and technologies will keep the sector working in terms of it's gonna be the cornerstone of a recovery. 
And I think it's fair to say that digital, we believe, will be key to supporting better outcomes, ones that are safer, better performing, more sustainable. And I think a key thing is still to continue to attract new talent into a sector. So we believe that digital solutions will provide a route to sector re recovery, but I think also underpin future resilience in the construction sector. So thank you for listening to our message. And again, what we say, you know, please get involved. You've got our details up there. Visit us, get involved. We've got lots of partners on the platform construction system as well. So thank you to listening as to how we believe that digital is going to help us achieve better outcomes and support transformation. Thank you, Dave. That was excellent. Um, if you can now um, unshare your screen and I will hand over to Fiona. Fiona, could you start sharing your screen, please? First, I'll unmute myself. Hopefully you can all hear me now. Yeah, that's great. Thank Hi. you, Fiona. Back Thanks, you go. Fiona. Hard act to follow, Dave. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, this is all part of the new normal, isn't it? I'm sat in my spare bedroom talking to a, a, a good number of you um, without being able to see your faces and your reactions. Um, I know a number of you. To those that I do know, hello. It's good to uh, see you on this and hope to catch up with you soon. So as part of the new normal, we're working remotely. We're as busy as ever. And this piece of work the BIM Interoperability Expert Group are undertaking, we want to increasingly share with industry. I believe it's a really important part of upskilling and recovery. And we don't want to sit in a corner doing this quietly and then expose our working out. We want to engage with you. So a bit of a call here to, to action. If this is something that interests you, then please do get in touch. Um, who I am, for those of you who haven't, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting. My name's Fiona Moore. I'm part of CDBB's implementation team and the work that we do comes under the Construction Innovation Hub. I've been working closely with a number of you and Dave and the rest of the, the BIM team in the UK in getting BIM out there and used so that we can get the, the beneficial value of it. And let's be honest, we've come an awful long way and BIM is embedded in many projects. I think we've got a variety of understanding of what BIM is and it's that information piece that interests me most. Dave's talked about the interoperability of building co components, putting together a platform. Ultimately, that is going to provide us with a built asset, but also lots of information that will help us going forward. And we need to address this problem of interoperability. It's not always a problem, and I know there's lots of people working on a future state, more from um, Mark when he speaks, but you know, we need to address some of the real world issues, and that's what the group's been put in place to address. So what do we mean by interoperability? Well, the definition we've used is the ability of two or more systems to exchange information and to use the information that has been exchanged. And why is this interesting to us? Well, increasingly we're looking at information beyond the capital stage that can be used during the whole asset life cycle. We're looking at major procurers now that have been in the BIM space for a long time. They understand the value of the use of this information. Think of the number of times you start on, for example, a refurbishment pro uh, project and you can't get to asset information as built information. So it's obvious that this information is useful to, to clients. They need to procure and protect this information. Then we have to do justice to their suppliers. You know, if they're asking for that information, what does that mean from a supplier point of view? What is it they need to do to, to meet their clients' expectations? So to that end, we need to consider information and how it's exchanged across the contract line. There are lots of clever and innovative proprietary solutions out there that help supply chains to collaborate and to exchange information. And all of those are valid. But quite often this, this falls over when information is passed across the contract line, is received by the procurer and they have no way of housing that information and making um, proper use of it. 
So we need to address all this in the context of authoring software's proprietary solutions. We started our whole BIM journey around the premise, but with the BIM task group, the government's construction strategy, that we would take an open approach to resolve the question of interoperability. And things haven't always landed in that way. So ultimately what we're trying to address is real world application. In the UK, having developed the, the British standards and now being lucky enough to, to have, have helped inform the international standards with lots of good work um, in, in that space, um, we have context for all of this and we can talk about theory, but increasingly we need to talk about practice. What does it mean for somebody sat at a desk who's been asked to produce Kobe, for example? Um, what does that mean? What do they need to do in the application to provide what it is the client is asking for? And we're not treading on the toes of the National Digital Twin work that Mark will talk about next. Um, there, there obviously is um, lots of crossover, but we're talking about the short term now and in the next five years. So it is to help people in this space to achieve interoperability, to produce practical end results in the short term. We are, however, and I know Mark would say this himself, producing strong foundations for the digital twin. Mark is very much, and others in, in the space of the natural digital twin work are very much looking at what we're doing um, and there is a conversation going on. I say all of that because, you know, I, I get a lot of people saying, we have solved this, we will solve this. And again, I can't say strongly enough. Yeah, but what does that mean when we're talking about recovery, when we're talking about resilience? for small to medium sized design enterprises, for example. What does it mean in practical terms to them? So all this came about because a conversation was had where we were talking about um, BIM, we were talking about information management, and we were talking about its pra practical application. And a discussion was had around the fact that things are not as easy as the process, the standards, the strategy, the theory make them seem. And how do we change that? Well, the first thing we decided to do was to go out to industry and ask a series of questions to actually measure what experts in this field felt on the subject and what, what it was, where the gaps were and what it was that we needed to address. So these are the four questions we asked. How are you, or the industry as a whole, currently achieving or providing the means for information and data openness and interoperability? What problems do you encounter um, when you're trying to deliver interoperable data? So what is the here and now? Where are the blockers? What do you think could be used to deliver interoperable data in future? And again, only a five year time frame and what needs to change to happen to achieve interoperability going forward. I got into a discussion on this subject with someone about a week ago, and it all came back to people and cultures and attitudes and so on and so forth. And a lot of this is about people. So um, I'll talk more about it in a, bit, in a bit, but a lot of this, I'll come back to the fact, is about educating, sharing experiences, seeing all of you, as part of this, this conference, all of the people out in, in the industry um, delivering projects as stakeholders in this work. So once we'd gathered that evidence, we started to sift it. We started to look at themes. We started to look at where we needed to address specific areas. And we produced a report that was published back in April, the, the BIM Interoperability Expert Group report. Now, who are we? Well, we were a panel of interested people across the UK government, the Centre for Digital Built Britain, um, people who have enough insight into this, but maybe not a deep dive into the, the practical elements of it. We heard the evidence, we met and we went through a thorough, robust process of evaluating what we heard and putting this report together. The report is short. I recommend that you read it if you have any interest in this area. And the appendix gives you some of the evidence, some of the, the actual um, 
wording we heard um, so that you can better understand the context of all of this. One of the key things that came out of all of this is the need for UK government to continue to promote the use of BIM. We've had the government construction strategy, we have the UK BIM mandate, which is still current, and there's a need to keep that current and to keep the momentum going. It worked very well that BIM was um, a government initi initiative and led by government, and government needs to continue to do that. And that came out loud and clear in the report. In addition, we had more detail recommendations, and I'm going to go through those now with a view that you can better understand this in context and understand how, how you as individuals could become stakeholders in our work. So you'll see the primary recommendations on your screen on the right, and these turned into a series of four interoperability work streams. The first one being classification. It started with classification scheme and alignment. In the UK, that all starts with Uniclass 2015, and we're working very closely with MVS on that piece of work, but also how that maps to other classifications. Now, we're well aware there's lots of really good work going on in that area, and what we'd like to do is signpost that work so that those that need to read across various classifications can do so and they know how to get the, to the tools that will help them do that. But ultimately, what we also need to address is Uniclass itself, how we ensure that people within industry who need to help inform um, Uniclass have that com necessary conversation, um, how we get various sectors within, in, within industry to, to coalesce and give us a consistent answer when we're looking at certain technical elements of classification. So that's an extremely important work stream. It's underway. Please do talk to us, especially if you can help us understand how we get to various parts of the industry most efficiently. Through the UK, um, BIM Alliance, we've got the various BIM4 groups, um, which are really helpful, but there may be other um, sector elements, be it rail or, you know, um, aviation or whatever we need to get to that could come to the fore and have that discussion with us. COBE was um, the means of passing information across the contract line written into the BIM mandate. It's still asked for consistently by central government. What does that mean? How do we produce COBE? And that's why we need, you know, COBE is a model view definition of industry foundation class. So we've combined those two elements together so we can better understand um, what Building Smart International are doing in this space, what we need to learn from them. And, and this is a constant theme. We're not necessarily coming up with the answers ourselves, but what we're going to help industry to do is understand the wider landscape and make sure that you are best informed about best practice and the most efficient way forward to provide interoperability. As I mentioned earlier, a key thing is culture and, and human beings. So our third key work stream is education and skills. At the moment, we're looking at the benefits case for BIM, split into various personas, whether you're a procurer, procurer where you are in the supply chain. And it has to be said, you know, I've spoken a lot about clients and information across the contract line, but there are various contract lines in the procurement process. So, you know, at one point you may be a constructor, at the next point you are a, a client to someone who is somewhere else further down in the supply chain. So education and skills is key, understanding the benefits of all of this and taking a persona approach is key. So watch this space. A lot of the, the engagement and communications we're going to be doing will be based around education and skills. All of this happens in context. So standards are key. And we have a work stream to, to which is currently looking at British standards, international standards, how they all fit together in this space, where there's clashes and overlap, um, whether we need to potentially consider those in moving this work forward. Those are the primary 
recommendations and enablers that we're currently addressing. In addition, we're looking at some of the secondary recommendations, but frankly, these are quickly coming to the fore. Workstream 5 is, in, is currently termed information management platform. Um, it was called in the report an AIM CDE, an asset information model common data environment. I haven't got much time to talk about this, but in a nutshell, it's how do procurers get that information across the contract line? How do they ask for information? In what format do they ask for that information? How do they assure the quality of that information when they receive it? How do they measure that quality before it actually gets to their AIM CDE? So we've moved the terminology on. It's not yet set in stone, but I think information management platform is the best, best way of, of articulating at the moment. But it's helping procurers provide a seamless process for asking for information, measuring information and inheriting information into their systems. Two new work streams that have only kicked off in the last couple of weeks are standard information approach. We called it standard data approach, but actually we're talking about information requirements and standardizing those. Can clients approach their information requirements in a common way so that each time as a supplier you'll ask for information, it looks similar. It's sort of an 80-20 rule. Do most clients need um, information in common? That's your 80 percent. And any information they need that's bespoke is the 20 percent. And briefly, Dave mentioned the information, the BIM information requirements wiki tool that we're developing. We're developing a tool that it is hoped um, client entities and their supply chains could start to play with to try and take a wiki approach to, if not reaching a consensus, trying to standardise this information approach across industry. And then finally, and this is not treading on the toes of others who are in this space across CIH, procurement contract directly relating to interoperability. So how do we need to write in two contracts the need to achieve um, technical interoperability? It's not good enough to say, give us BIM. We need to get into the weeds and we need to articulate exactly what that means technically. So before I wrap up, just to repeat, there'll be frequent updates to industry as the programme of work progresses. We're looking at how to engage. There'll be blogs and there'll be blogs coming out in the next couple of weeks, um, giving more detail on this because this has been a rapid run through what we're doing. We propose putting together articles. There's a section on the CDBB website and that section will be subdivided into the various work streams. So if you take a particular interest in the work stream, you will be able to be informed as to what we're doing via that route. But we're looking at increasing one-to-one -one consultation, roundtable discussions and workshops to address these technical issue, issues. So if you want to become a stakeholder, you may already be on our list because we may have identified you with, without having yet engaged with you but please do get involved with CDBB engagement by the address you can see on this page. So thank you, Will, for this opportunity to talk to everybody. And I really look forward to the opportunity of talking to many of you again as the work progresses. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona, for that excellent presentation. Um, if I can ask you to unshare, which you have now, and Mark, if um, I can now ask you to screen share and uh, over to Mark. Hi, thanks very much. I'm just hoping that that's come into the, the full screen. Can you con confirm that you're seeing that? Okay. Yeah, that's fine, Mark. Okay. Thank you. So, um, thankfully, Dave and Fiona have done kind of half my job actually in uh, in setting the context and done a done a brilliant job for that. Um, because so much of what the National Digital Twin is about uh, is built on, on BIM. So, um, uh, like I say, really set the context well. But what I'd like to do in this, in this short time is uh, introduce the, the National Digital Twin and explain what it is uh, and also what it, what it isn't. Uh, and in order to get there, I feel I need to set a bit more context. Uh, and at the end, what I hope to do is uh, introduce the Gemini principles uh, as, as promised by, by Will at the top. So I think uh, something which is a useful bit of context for this 
uh, is the, the starting point for the whole thing, the whole programme, which came from uh, a report out of the National Infrastructure Commission a few years ago called Data the Public Good. And if you've not seen that report, I'd really commend it to you. Uh, it, it's, it's visionary. I would say it's a seminal, seminal report. It's the kind of thing which can uh, define the, the future of our industry. So I'd, I'd, I'd recommend it to you. But at a high level, what it recommended was that we should move towards having a national digital twin and that to enable it we should put in place an information management framework. I'll explain what that is in a minute uh, and then to enable that uh, we should pull together people from across government and industry and academia so that we align and pull together to achieve the above. <clears throat> and so that the role of CDBB in all of this uh, is to deliver that information management framework that unlocks it all but, it, but it's not our job to go and build the national digital twin the idea is that we unlock it we enable it we facilitate it uh, but it will be the market that builds it uh, and so what we see we're doing here really is building a whole new category a whole new market of, of some really exciting work of developing digital twins and, and connecting them up uh, so, like I say, CDBB's job is to deliver that information management framework. It's also our job to help to foster the alignment uh, and get the industry to, to pull in the same direction. And events like this, I think, are, are really helpful um, for getting that message out and, and indicating that this is a collaborative exercise where really we need to build consensus and pull in the same direction. Uh, and, and the direction that we're going in <coughs> is this fantastic grand vision that we have for digital built Britain uh, and CDBB are the kind of the guardians of that that vision uh, CDBB if you don't know about it already is um, a collaboration a partnership between Bayes and Cambridge University uh, and the vision that is described I think can, can be uh, summarized in the, in the four words here the design build operate and integrate uh, and the programs that CDB works on cover all of those areas um, and a huge part of it is covered by BIM. And this is one of the, the points that I, I really want to get across to, to start with, is that um, the foundation that has been laid in the work that we've already done in BIM is an essential foundation for the National Digital Twin. We couldn't even imagine the National Digital Twin uh, without that foundation being laid. Because one of the key things that it does is show us just how important information is and how we need to manage that information through the whole life cycle. It means that we can see information as a value carrier. Uh, and, and if it makes sense in design and build, and now um, uh, as with the, uh, the recent part of uh, ISO 19650 uh, on into operation, then we can also see how information uh, is uh, that same value carrier uh, throughout the whole of the system of the built environment and how we can use it to, to integrate. So we've got, got these words, design, build, operate and integrate, <coughs> that can describe uh, this, uh, this exciting vision. But um, another thing that I want to emphasize is that it's those same words that appear in the UK BIM framework. This is the same vision. So what we're talking about really with BIM and the National Digital Twin is a continuum. It's not a, a different thing where we can go and forget the work we've done on BIM because we've got something more exciting now. It's not that. What we're saying is that this is a continuum and, and the more we recognize it as such, uh, I think the more successful we will be. And so that work that Fiona's uh, just described so well uh, on interoperability, um, she was at pains to tell you that, it, that it's very much focusing on the here and now, but that whole issue about interoperability is absolutely central to the national digital twin um, and um, when I come in a moment to uh, to introduce exactly what it is you'll see why interoperability is absolutely at the heart of the national digital twin so hopefully I've made the point now this is a continuum we're, we're talking we're you know carrying on the same story it's not a not a different story <clears throat> so another bit of context for the national digital twin uh, is uh, how we see the built environment. And I think it's important here, uh, not just to describe the scope of the National Digital Twin, which covers economic infrastructure, social infrastructure, and the interface with the natural environment. I mean, it's obviously important that we know the scope that we're talking about, but it's kind of seeing how these things are interconnected. Because when you add all of those layers up, you get the built environment. 
Uh, and this is the most amazing complex machine that we've built for ourselves, that, that we live within, that enables society to function. But the point is that we've built an awful lot of it already. Uh, and it is uh, de facto a system of systems. And we kind of have to see that system to get the value out of the system. Uh, and so we've already talked about um, managing information through the life cycle. It becomes important to see uh, just how those life cycles fit together. So this diagram, uh, I think, helps to illustrate that. It shows that at the center is the use, the use of our built environment. You know, that's where we get the value from it. That's, that's kind of why it exists. It's to benefit people and society. And, and it's the, the use of the infrastructure, the services we get from it that deliver the outcomes we want, the, um, the outcomes in terms of social, economic and environmental outcomes. So the use is, is central. And in order to unlock that use, we need to operate and maintain it. Uh, and the operation and maintenance really has to go on forever. For as long as we want society to exist and thrive, we need to operate and maintain our, our built environment. So that's really a system process that goes on forever. It's not a life cycle thing, it goes on forever. Uh, but then every now and again, we need new bits to our, our system. Uh, and so we kick off um, a process that delivers our, our new assets or possibly modifies the one we've already got. So we plan, we design, we build, we commission. And so then we integrate the new assets into the system. Uh, and so we can see the value of those, um, those interventions, the interventions on the system um, that are, are the projects that we're very familiar with. But really what we're describing here uh, is, is a whole. We're not just talking about the parts. We kind of need to see the system and get the best out of the system to deliver the best outcomes for people and society. And I think it's only really when we see that whole system and the whole life cycle that then we can start to imagine the cyber physical system. Uh, and so this terminology, I think, is becoming more familiar, but it's really about applying the thinking of Industry 4.0 to infrastructure. You could call it Infrastructure 4.0. It, it's it's uh, something where we see the merging of digital assets and physical assets. And I think as an industry, we're very familiar and actually very good with physical assets, uh, but we haven't yet recognized the value of digital assets, which is to do with data and information, but also the code we use to, to process that. Uh, we need to really recognize that these are genuine assets that need to be valued and managed. And it's when we bring together digital and physical, then we get smart. Uh, and so what we're talking about in this digital transformation of the built environment, this, this um, vision that I described earlier for Digital Built Britain. It's really about bringing digital and, and physical together. So now that we've seen the whole system, and that means we can see the cyber physical system, uh, we can describe the, uh, the digital twin and how it, uh, how it applies to it. And I think central to this is recognizing the uh, information value chain and how we derive value from our data. Now, this will be very familiar to you, I am sure, uh, but it's worth just emphasizing it because data itself is kind of just a resource. Um, we need to do something with it to get something of value. You know, we process the data, we structure it, we, make, we cleanse it, we make it fit for use, but then we have to do something uh, to it that, that extracts the, uh, the insight. And so we uh, apply analysis, we do sense making, and it's that that adds value. It means that we've got something which is of greater value than the data from which it, it originated. And we use that to make better decisions. Now I'd suggest that it's actually the better decision making, which is the thing that releases the value in this. You know, it's, it's not that we um, have digital twins or uh, do all sorts of data processing you know, ju just because we can or because it's fun. It's because it delivers the insight that enables better decisions that drive the better interventions and enable the better outcomes. So it's the decision making, which is the thing that releases the value. So we like the information value chain. And in many ways, we can see a digital twin as being the embodiment of that, where what we do basically is take data from the physical world uh, we do something clever with it. We generate the insights that enables us to make those better decisions, which can drive interventions back in the real world. So 
at one level, it is true to say that a digital twin is a digital representation of something physical. You know, there, there's something true about that. But really what makes it a twin is the connection, the data connection between the thing that's being modelled and the model. Um, and what we would say for digital twins is that it can actually be a digital twin of assets, processes and systems in the built environment. So it doesn't have to be a physical thing. It can also be a, a digital twin of a process. So uh, that kind of expands the, uh, expands the understanding out of it. But um, if we can see that uh, we can make a digital twin of, of all sorts of things, it could be um, of individual assets or networks, we can see that we can really drive value from understanding the, the, the physical thing better, but also um, helping us to predict what will happen um, if, uh, if certain scenarios apply. So that's an individual digital twin. But if we like the idea of individual twins, why wouldn't we then start thinking about how they can be connected up? Because if you've got a digital twin, which is helping you to optimize the operation of a train, and you've also got a digital twin um, of signaling and track, um, then, then it kind of makes sense, doesn't it, that we would share data between those twins uh, because some of the data, not all of it, some of it would be relevant to the other digital twins. And so we start to see the idea of connecting digital twins. But that can extend up a level, can't it, where we can then see the connection between uh, different modes of transport, between rail and road and, and air. And then we can take it up again, where we can see the benefit of sharing data between sectors. Uh, energy and transport or energy and water because it's self-evident that those sectors are connected so why wouldn't there be um, value in sharing data across those and the digital twins which are which are involved in them and so what we can see here is is that an ecosystem of connected digital twins and that really is the definition of, of our national digital twin it's not intended to be one massive model of everything it's intended to be much more organic than that. It would be um, an ecosystem of connected twins where we build it kind of one connection at a time, or one use case at a time, driven by purpose. So each digital twin would have its own purpose, but then we'd connect digital twins where there's a point in connecting them. So we're not talking about connecting every twin with every other twin. It's only driven by, uh, by purpose and, and by value. So that's introduced uh, what the national digital twin is. Um, I think that um, you probably already understand where that can provide us uh, with value to society, the econ economy, uh, to, to business and, and to the environment. Uh, and and uh, inevitably on this call already, we've had uh, net zero mentioned. You can kind of see that with something like net zero, uh, that it is quintessentially a systemic challenge. Uh, and so it demands to have systems-based solutions. You know, it, it needs to have information shared across sectors for us to have a hope of, of solving that. So that's exactly the kind of thing that uh, the National Digital Twin feeds into. Uh, and, and what you'll see is at the heart of the, uh, the National Digital Twin is this concept um, of sharing data. If you boil it down to its essence, uh, what it becomes about is secure, resilient data sharing across organizational and sector boundaries. Uh, and so when I said earlier on that CDBB's job is to enable this and it's somebody else's job to go and build it, the enabling, the core of the enabling is about secure, resilient data sharing. Uh, and that's where the information management framework comes in. It's all about interoperability to enable that data sharing, to enable consistency and quality of data. Uh, and we produced this uh, this paper early in the year. Um, I'd commend this to you as well. Uh, even though it's technical, it's very readable. Uh, and um, what it recommends is that we move towards uh, having this semantic solution uh, to enable the consistency and quality of data that would reduce the friction of data sharing uh, and, uh, and effectively pave the way for the National Digital Twin. And then the final point that I'd make, uh, I said I'd eventually come around to it, is on the Gemini principles. What we see is that this journey, this exciting journey for the National Digital Twin needs to be guided by values. It needs to be principles based. And so one of the very first things that we did as a programme uh, was develop and, and suggest 
these principles that would guide us through what could be um, a, a multi-decade, multi-generational uh, journey to, to get uh, to the, the National Digital Twin. So uh, it's built on purpose, trust and function. I won't run through what all the principles are, but if you're interested in them, uh, we can pick them up in the, uh, in the questions afterwards. But something I would point out is how uh, built into it is, is some kind of tension. So you see right at the centre there, um, we're saying that uh, it, it should be as open as possible. But also we're saying that uh, it must enable security and be secure itself. And so you can see it may be in some ways that there's a tension between openness and security. We're not saying what the balance point should be between those. We're just saying that they're both important. Uh, and then it becomes a conversation for us in the industry to work out where that right balance point is so that we can get the national digital twin uh, that we want and that, and that we deserve. So with that, I would like to, uh, to say thank you and uh, hand over. Thank you, Mark. That was excellent. Um... I'm now going to invite Aviv to speak and share his screen. Um, Aviv, over to you. Perfect, thank you. Um, so, hello everyone, and I am Aviv. Uh, short introduction. I am one of the co-founders of this company called Bill Dots. I myself come from a, from a technological background and I am in charge of the, the product and the customer facing roles within the company. So with that, just to provide a short intro on what BuildOps is before I speak about uh, my experience for, for today's topic. So quick, quick intro on, on the product itself. Basically, the product is meant to provide project controls to, to project teams on site. The way we go about this is we take 360 degree cameras, we give them to, or, or they are bought by contractors and they're used by the site team these will be sort of mounted on hard hats as people go about, go about their day, go about their routine, and anywhere that the camera visits is analyzed by our software. This is an AI-based software that will identify where this person has been with the camera and what it needs, what needs to, to be within that space based on the design, based on a model, a BIM, BIM model, and then correlate that with the program understand where we are and what is going on and is there anything that is uh, not, work, not, not being done at the right throughput or not being done correctly and all that is available through this dashboard system but uh, build us is not really the topic today so I won't be speaking too much about the specifics of that. Just to give you though one short image to explain I think it explains a bit better what it is what we're seeing here is a snapshot from our system this explains how it works. On the right, you're seeing the drawing of that specific floor, the element there marked, the blue dot is the position of the person who was doing the capturing at the time. And then on the left there is the wall, which is the element that the system is currently analyzing. And the white overlay is an overlay of the element from the BIM model on top of reality and then and then this analyzed to, in this case, be done. Therefore, therefore, this element is done. And that's how this gathers data uh, across all activities and across the entire, the entire project. OK, with that said, before I, I go into sort of speaking about productivity and, um, and digital and our topic for today, I wanted to start with sort of explaining why it is that we built a system that is completely dependent on BIM. Uh, I think this. This explains a bit about, you know, speaking about digital and why it is important for construction, then BIM and why that is important for us sort of speaks to that as well. Now, the reason for this is that we have a system that automatically AI-based tracks progress and, and a bit of quality of the work. Now, the only way that you can do that is if there's a very clear definition uh, of what it is that you're tracking. Now, when, when projects are designed in BIM, then we see that it is what we call design for production, meaning you actually expect to see a very high correlation between the design and what will actually be built because a lot of things have been sort of figured out in the design phase. And 
this thing that, that enables real coordination that makes sure there is consistency across the different, the different drawings and details is something that is critical because while a person can walk into a room and, says, and say, yeah, okay, uh, the system here is installed because I can see it and I can understand it, uh, an automatic system like ours will track the specific design and will look for that. Uh, and as I, as I write here, you can only track what you can predict. So I think this explains why we use BIM, but also explains why BIM is, in my mind, critical uh, for the industry, but that, is, that has been spoken about uh, enough generally and today. Okay, so now a few words about increasing productivity with, with digital tools, and I'll explain this through my build -ups experience. Some of these uh, examples are, are, of course, from projects that we use the system on. So to touch on the main points and why I tried to make this more about productivity, about saving in, in, in people's time and in time on site, everything that has to do with sort of recovery from COVID. Obviously, a lot of these are also uh, have financial implications, and I will mention a few of these, but the main topic for today is, is about people's time. So first, program tracking, the fact that there's an, there is something here, a piece of software, that automatically, automatically tracks progress against the program means A, that you have this information, which is very objective, it is very coherent, which is critical because it's not a, a subjective matter of done, but it's an objective definition. That brings us to a point where there's one piece of, one piece of information that everyone can discuss and, and doesn't require site management time to capture the data, to collect the data, or doesn't require the time to, to discuss, let's call it, all this and to spend some time understanding where we truly are. Next is an early warning system, what I call it. Basically, this is about two critical things, knowing that, that the work is done and done correctly, and knowing that it's done at the right throughput. Now, all of this obviously speaks very highly to productivity because when things are done correctly in the right order and completed when they should be uh, fully completed, 100% of the work during the first visit of that activity, that really increases productivity and stops all these rework problems that, that we all know. And finally, this concept, of course, called the single source of truth. So this system documents everything that is happening and connects that with, with the visuals. And it, of course, supports a lot of workflows, but the, the, the essential part of this is, is, as I mentioned just a second ago, that the collaboration becomes a much easier your process because suddenly we're not discussing we're discussing on top of information which brings us to a point that generally speaking collaboration is easier and, and flows better let's call it but also of course with people working remotely and we have seen that um, during these past few months of course okay to expand a bit about each of these points first automated tracking so i'll give an example here we are deployed on a 300 plus unit uh, residential units project in London. And what the site team there sort of assessed is that to do one, it's called one go of collecting the data, of capturing visuals so that you can support that data and producing a drop line in the, in the program in total will take around 80 man hours. And then when you use this system, it's just about the people walking around. So that is four hours. And actually a lot of times they will do that while they do other daily tasks, so you might think that it's a bit less. And the critical part about, th about this, of course, is just people don't really have that much time in general on construction sites, especially now where we're seeing projects that have a reduced sort of a management team or people working 50% uh, of the time from home or anything like that. And saving this sort of, you know, let's call it collection time is critical and can the time up to make the decisions to understand what needs to be done in the future. Next, uh, call it full details, but this is an example of this early warning idea. So in this example, what happened here is this is about more the quality of work. This was uh, during the lightweight steel frame construction on this, on this project. And basically what you can see here on the left, the two images, is that originally there was an opening missing there. You can see studs and cross bracing going through that, but seeing how it was picked up, 
it was then it was then fixed and and the opening is formed. Now the idea here is that this project has 515 doors on 812 such walls. Two openings were missing. And the amount of work that it would require for a person to walk around and check every single one manually is exactly the sort of thing that will reduce productivity. And then you're, you're faced with two options. Either you reduce productivity because you're spending a lot of effort in making sure of all these little details, which actually I think is not, is not real, not in a large scheme. And, or you reduce productivity because you don't find this and, and, and sort of examples like this. And what happens is that somewhere down the line, you have to do a lot of rework, you have to do a lot of second visits. And the possible effect here, again, assessed by the site team, would be a one week delay. So that is, of course, um, a, a big impact on the productivity of, of this project and of everything. And again, there's also the financial element of this rework and, and what that costs. Another example of that, but from a very different sort of uh, sort of uh, angle. So we had we did a little sort of research across the projects where we de were deployed, and we saw that if you're looking at residential schemes again, between two and ten elements are missing per apartment. These are snags that are not picked up while 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 ongoing snagging, let's call it, it's not picked up during the, the, main, the main construction phase. Now, between two and 10 of these, yes, they are small. Uh, it's one socket, it's one switch, but they cause the rework. They cause a lot of headache for the site team. And these handover periods become something that we have to chase around. Again, uh, pretty obvious, the, the effect on productivity here. There's also the financial aspect. Once again, uh, we came up to a point where we sort of with our clients understood that it's at least 300 pounds per unit to correct these. And then it's about depending how, are you the two per apartment or the 10 per apartment example, but it's anywhere between 60,000 and 250,000 pounds for such a scheme. But again, to reiterate the main point for the day, the productivity that is maintained when, when this doesn't happen, this doesn't need to happen, when you know a day after the, in this case, electrician of this image left the apartment that there's actually an opening there missing and there's a box that should be there that's missing uh, is tremendous. And if we can get to a point where all of this is done on first visits truly, then that could be very significant to the, the way we do things. And lastly, but most importantly, is uh, resource management in terms of a real site example. So basically, this is about maintaining the continuous flow of construction. And this is something that is very difficult to do. It's very difficult to do, in my mind, mainly because we don't really know what's going on. So to understand the implications and what to do with it is very difficult. What we're seeing here is a few snapshots from our system on a specific project. We're seeing that there's a problem with the throughput of first fixed partitions. We're seeing that they're active on four different floors. None of them are done. And then, we have screed that's about to follow up and you need to manage your resources in this case to make sure that the flow can continue and there are no problems that cause sort of dense in productivity and then dense in the people's motivation to be on this site and people leaving site and all of this uh, knock on effect. So that we're seeing on the top is that is that snapshot of the current situation and what was done in this case was that they be, we organize, it's called the resources, to make sure that, in this case, that level four is completed quickly to allow, to allow work to continue. But also, this was used as sort of back, uh, back, backing information to decide that more workers, more laborers are needed on site and that they will truly be productive. That is what happened. And what we can also see here on the right with the historic work comparison is we can see sort of the knock-on effect of once first fixed partitions starts to lose touch, let's call it, with the program soon after, so does Screed, simply because they don't have available workspaces anymore. And that's exactly the, the sort of thing that you're trying to prevent. Finally, um, this single source of truth concept. So uh, to put it in, in lockdown perspectives and COVID perspectives, we saw across our projects that the usage went up, not by, but two, 200% during lockdown. And 
the, the nice thing about this is, and I think that the, what we can learn from this is that once people start using digital tools, and that's what happened during lockdown because there was no other way, uh, it could be that Psyche's used a tool for specific purposes before lockdown, but during lockdown, it was the only way to do a few things because they could not come to site. Once that happens, people get used to digital tools. And in our example, we saw that the usage rates were maintained once, once these individuals went back to site and continued working from site because they were exposed, let's call it, to the advantages of doing things in a different way. Um, so maybe a, a, small, a small positive for lockdown. Um, obviously, just to, to state why, this whole, this whole idea of information being available and not requiring the back and forth discussions between different parties on site is the significant <laughs> Apologies for that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> apologies for my uh, crazy dog here, but uh, I will finish. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Aviv. Um, um, I hope the dog doesn't get you. Um, anyway, um, we have concluded our four presentations. So um, we are now through to the Q&A session. Um, I'm going to unmute all of our panelists and um, start running through some of the questions that have been coming in. We um, are a little bit behind schedule, but we've still got um, plenty of time to go through the questions that have been coming in. So first up, um, and this is a question addressed to Dave, and this comes from Clara Chung, who asks, is, is the platform construction system mainly targeted at certain types of buildings, such as school and hospital, schools and hospitals, which are more standardized in terms of construction? <clears throat> Hi, well, I think that's a really great question. I think one of the big things about the platform construction system is it's designed to be very flexible. So there's flexibility in terms of room length and indeed the span. So the maximum span can go between nine and 12 meters and go up to four stories. So because of that, it's gonna be you know, suitable for a variety of applications. So in terms of schools, offices, apartments, but many, many more as well. So the idea of the program is just now we're working with and in partnership with government departments and industry to determine, you know, what the various if like needs are for building. So there's a lot of flexibility, but so basically so long as we can work within the parameters, you know, up to four stories, up to maximum span of uh, 12 meter, it's going to be available for a variety of applications. But starting somewhere you know the schools offices you know are a good starting point there so the things probably it's not you know really suitable for is more your warehouse your sporting halls with anything that's you know floor to ceiling generally exceeds say up to three meters but huge flexibility but you know schools and uh, offices make a good starting point thanks very much for that dave um a question for fiona um from daniel oney um, hi Fiona, will there be a concern for data security risk amid building information exchange, especially during this period where the adoption of remote working is on the increase as a result of COVID-19? And if there is, what efforts are being considered to mitigate the risks? Thanks Daniel, again another great question. Um, security has to be at the heart of everything we do. Um, as such, uh, we have a steering group that sits over the work of the expert group and we have a security representative on the, um, the steering group. As yet, our thinking across the various work streams isn't mature enough to start to, to answer your, your second question, what will the, the mitigation be? But in everything we do, we need to think about security. Um, if you're sharing information, it's a bit like I always used to say about emails. If you're writing an email, consider it a postcard. It's not a sealed letter. Um, so the first thing you have to do is, is understand what information you have to protect and why. So like any potential risk, it's about identifying areas of risk and not putting in blanket security where risk doesn't exist, but actually identifying the risk and, and, and responding appropriately. 
So I think the work stream it's going to be most appropriate to is the standard information uh, approach work stream where we're listing our information requirements <laughs> and we're considering which of those inf information requirements have a, a security impact. But watch this space, I can see us having a security work stream and if it's something that particularly interests you, Daniel, then you know, do engage with us. And Dave, I don't know if you want to um, comment on that as well, because I, I know your remit uh, covers uh, security. You've done quite a bit of work on this in the past. Yeah, I mean, I again, as Fiona says, a great question. I think, that, you know, the, the main thing is, you know, security is inherent in everything we do. You know, ISO 19650 Part 5, you know, has given us a great starting point. And, you know, we're working very closely with uh, CPNI to make sure that uh, everything is aligned. And again, I think it's a great resource. I say, if you know, if people can go to the CPNI website and uh, and have a look, there's a great resource there. Thanks, One thing, Will, though, just to say is, sure. you know, the, the view that we've always taken is, you know, that security is something is very holistic. It's not just about cyber security within there as well. It's you know, looking at all aspects of it. Sure, sure. Um, a couple of questions for Aviv, um, if you're still with us, Aviv. Um, how quickly is the data collected by BuildDot's cameras processed? Yeah, sure. So we're at a point today where it's between 24 and 48 hours, uh, depending on a number, number of project parameters. But I think the, the important sort of answer in this, in this regard is that we're looking to get it to 12 and then four hours. And the reasoning for that, which I think is key, is because again, when you look at digital tools and looking to use them for real process management, then suddenly you need data that is truly up to date. And for us, we're now at a point where it's between 24 and 48 hours, which makes it pretty up to date. But the, the real goal is to do a capture at the end of the day, have it ready the next morning. That's when this information can truly become a driving factor for everything that happens. Okay, and um, one other question, Aviv, uh, when when you you talked about the um, the project that uh, you, the technology had been used on, how receptive were the site team to, to using the technology, using the cameras, and how quickly did they get up to speed with it? Well, in terms of doing the capture, that was uh, pretty quick. It's pretty simple simple thing you, you mount it on a hard hat with a clip and then you press one button to do the capture nobody uh, had too much of a fuss uh, using that and i think the interesting part of that is that what we saw we saw subcontractors who are not the users of the system and are not the ones who are paying for it that is the main contractor suddenly became very aware of it and we're looking to i, I had a number of discussions with subcontractors from projects where we were deployed who wanted to see how they could maybe get it deployed on other projects that they're working on. Because, yes, it's not their tool, but they, everyone sees the benefit of having this information for that collaboration purpose. So then suddenly saying, well, if something is going on, I want to know it because it will come back to me eventually and I'd rather know about it early. So for me, that's a real testament to the fact that the industry needs to move more and more to a position where we all have the same information, we all have the same data, and we use it wisely together. Thank you, Aviv. Um, and uh, a question for Mark. Um, Mark, I just wondered which industry sectors um, where you're seeing the most um, adoption of, of digital twin principles, where, where you think we're, we're likely to see that um, take off um, most in, in the short term? Yeah, we're already seeing a lot of activity in uh, in energy uh, and in transport and in water, um, and uh, so that's that's really encouraging. Uh, and clearly, what we're wanting to do is uh, is encourage that advancement of the state of the art in in digital twins. Uh, but then, as I explained, we want to uh, help to get them connected up as well. So what what we're seeing at the moment is quite a lot of activity in developing individual twins. Um, but not so much yet in uh, trying to connect them up. Uh, but like I say, m main activity seems to be energy, transport and water. Uh, and, you know, the, the market is clearly growing very rapidly. 
Thanks, Mark. Um, I, I'm I'm guessing the the common theme there is that those are all uh, clients or end users um, which operate their assets as well. Um, someone's just asked a question about um, what sort of involvement you've had from end users in the digital twin process, including building operators and facility managers. Um, and has there been a different approach for these professionals? I just wondered what sort of um, take up you, you, you've had from from people on the sort of FM and building operations side. Yeah, yeah, and we also see quite a bit of, of activity in, in that space too. Um, and I think it's interesting to, to see kind of who really is the end user in all of this, because uh, you can kind of imagine people who are operating buildings might be the owners of the builders, uh, the, the owners of the building. Um, or uh, as the question has indicated, that the, the people doing the operation. Um, I, I think it's also good for us to see the end user being the person who, who's using the building. You know, it's you and me, it's, it's ordinary people who are living in these, in these buildings or working the buildings um, and uh, who get served by wider infrastructure. Uh, and and I, I think it's our job really to drive the uh, improvements for, for those ultimate end users uh, and that kind of gives the whole thing purpose. But but to kind of be a bit more specific about this particular question, uh, yes, we are seeing uh, quite a bit of activity uh, in facilities management and the, uh, the, the people who kind of operate um, buildings to, to make them livable and workable in. Okay. Uh, and Mark, you, you touched on net zero in your presentation, and I'd like to ask all the panel about that but but briefly from your perspective mark do you do you see net zero as a, a big uh, driver um among the the asset owners you speak to or who are looking at digital twins um very much so 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 i, I think uh, clearly net zero has has gone shooting up the uh, the agenda and is, is pretty much near the top for uh, for for everyone now, so so yes, we definitely see it uh, on, on the agenda. Um, whether or not that is specifically driving digital twins, I think is a is another matter. Um, the point that I was trying to make in in my presentation was that when it comes to the overall achievement of net zero, we really do need to see the system because you can't solve net zero in silos. Uh, and, you know, just just the same as other things like resilience uh, and like circular economy. These are systemic challenges that, that demand systems-based solutions. And that's where connected digital twins will come into their own. So, so I think what we see at the moment is more uh, work in silos. Um, but, but at some stage, we are going to have to lift our heads above that uh, and drive this cross-sector information sharing. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and Dave, um, there's, there's a, a link, I, I guess, with um, Net Zero and the, the whole platform platform strategy um do you, do you see net, net zero as, as, as coming up a lot in in, in the work you're doing and, yeah. and perhaps fiona you could also answer that after yeah, yeah indeed i mean i think it comes back to the key theme of today will you know construction needs to change and change quickly and i don't think that's simply because of covid but i think the other big thing is the policy environment is changing and we are seeing a greater focus by clients on probably two things you know whole life value in net zero within there. I think, you know, digitization is going to be really key for simulation to helping us do that, along with soft landings. You know, the, the last question around about, you know, engagement with the end user, I think soft landing is really key to with there as well. And I, and I completely agree with what Mark said as well. We can't solve, you know, the net zero challenges, A, by thinking about one theme. It's about convergence of our themes, especially about value, manufacturing, our platforms, assurance within there as well. So, and I think, you know, one of the key things Mark said as well is we have to think more about from a digital space is actually how we can integrate well as well. Well, that's going to be really key to helping us drive, giving us the data to make smart decisions around about net zero. But for me, the key me the message is, you know, net zero is an imperative, but we need to change and we need to change quickly. Thanks, Dave. And Fiona, do, do you want to um, give your take on that? Yeah, just briefly. I mean, net zero is one of the many reasons why we need interoperable information. I, f I find um, it really encouraging hearing from Aviv and an increased take up. Um, 
and that's what we need. He, he talked about being able to share real time information. Unfortunately, and, and Mark mentioned it, working in silos, not having the bigger picture doesn't help you get to net zero, does it? So it's all of the above. It's being able to have information in the right, right format in good time to make good decisions. So net zero and many other advantages will be served by this. And Aviv, the same question to, to you really. Um, obviously there are um, benefits on the environmental side with, with, with your technology, but do you, do you feel that your customers are, are, are appreciating those benefits? I think that yes, as a short answer, but in general, I think that the, the, the impressive thing about British construction is that you see on sites that there are a lot of different people who sort of hold different stakes and care about different things. And that really comes to play when you bring information that everyone can use because each person has sort of their own viewpoint of it. And we're really seeing that take, being taken up with, you know, with the right people on site. So yes, definitely yes. Okay, thanks for that, Aviv. Um, I'm just going to give one final question now to um, the whole panelists. Um, I'm sorry if I'm, you're hearing me a little bit quiet now. I'm, I'm trying to speak up a bit. Um, the question or the title of this webinar was putting digital at the heart of the built environment's recovery in this post, hopefully post-pandemic era. Um, so, so to each of you, do, do you think the companies and clients and so on that you're working with, do they see digital as central to their strategy in the coming years? Um, starting with you, Dave. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at the heart of it, I mean, it's been incredible what we've been through in the last couple of months. But I think from our clients, we're seeing a real emergence of a genuine movement for change and indeed think wider transformation. And I think we're seeing digitization sitting right at the heart of there. But also at the same time, making sure we get the basics right in terms of good, secure information management. Sorry, I think we've lost Dave there. For Sorry, the I, I'm here, Will. Can you hear you're, me now? You're there? Oh, okay. Um, thanks, Dave. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you want me to say that again, sort of thing. So, you know, my view is, yes, from clients, we, we think we're really seeing an emergence of a genuine movement for transformation and change with digital right at the heart there. And I must admit, I've got a real sense of excitement about the, our future and how digital is going to support our built environment recovery. Thanks, Dave. And, and Fiona, the same question to you. Yeah, my background is in a, as an architectural technologist, and I work quite closely with, with two architecture companies um, in, in my re UK region. Um, very anecdotally, the, the more mature um, of those two practices, it will not be named, has fared much better um, of late in that they've been able to work remotely, they've been able to be agile, they've been able to be creative, um, the other company has struggled, but I think it's partly because of the sectors they work in and the willing, willingness of their clients to engage. Um, I think that the more leading digital company has been lucky with its clients and has probably selected its clients because they're more digital. So let's not forget, you know, this is a transaction and quite often the, the supplies in all of this are led by the client's appetite for it. So, yes, I see great enthusiasm. I feel sorry for those businesses that that can't easily jump onto this journey because, you know, maybe their clients aren't as, as forward looking as they are. Good answer. Uh, and Mark, the uh, same question to you. Yeah, I mean, what it feels like to me is that, is that COVID has been an incredibly cruel teacher. But, but we have to learn the lessons. And, and it seems that, that some of the, the lessons which have been coming out really loud and clear is, is just how connected everything is uh, and also just how important data is uh, and, and that digital is essential. It's not, it's not a choice now. So, so I think another thing which is pretty clear is, is that the economy will be in a worse state as a result of, of COVID. So, so what that tells me is is that um, we've got to get more out of what we've got. Uh, and uh, I, I guess all of those things just point towards us needing to make progress in this uh, digital twin and connected digital twin area, because 
you know that's that's what they'll do they'll they'll help us to get more out of what we've got when we see that whole system uh, and use digital to the extent to which uh, it's possible we're not we're not doing it yet but we can get there so so i i think there's something hopeful in the message even though um you know the, the picture looks pretty bleak i think if, if we learn the lessons uh, we recognize the system we make the most of digital i think we've got a chance of um, of making that recovery a good positive message and um over to aviv i, I know you you've already indicated that there's been um increased tape take up of your technology um since lockdown started um perhaps you could just say a few few final thoughts on that yeah definitely so well in general i think that you know we as a company when we founded it we decided to start uh to start with the british market because we believed it's advanced in its approach to construction technologies and i think that has proven itself pretty strongly because i mean uh, to give one point that sort of proved that all the examples of from projects that i've shown you today and from Actually, I think a vast majority of projects, probably 80, 90% that we are operating in are from clients that sort of heard about us and approached us. So that speaks to, to the way the industry and specifically the companies I'm, I'm working with currently are approaching this whole, this whole digital, digital construction thing. That's great. Thank you very much, Aviv. Um, we are just about out of time, so uh, we've actually overrun a bit, but uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today, David Philp, Fiona Moore, Mark Enzer, and Aviv Libovici from Bill Dots. Just leads me to say you'll be able to access this webinar on demand if you need to. More information on Bill Dots is available on their website, buildots.com and you can find details about the rest of the program on the event website digitalconstructionsummit.uk and editorial coverage of all of the sessions across the next three days will be available on constructionmanagermagazine.com and bimplus.co.uk so that's it um, for this first session thanks once again to bill dots and everyone who participated and uh, we will close it there. Thank you.